When I undertook to do a survey of technical communication in the Luke and Steele archives, I didn't know what I was going to find. As far as I know, no one has ever done this before, looked at technical communication within a single industry and a single site over time. One of the things that I found was that very little written technical communication existed between 1810 and 1870. Between 1870 and 1890, things began to change, and by 1890 many workers had joined the owners in creating a web of text, the glue that eventually held the mill together. It was only after the turn of the century that technical communication fully came of age at Lucan Steel. This lack of written communication was because the technology, between 1810 and 1870, was relatively simple at the Lucan's plant. Seventeen men worked in the mill until the Civil War, and when demand for their product increased, then they simply doubled the number. In an environment such as this, technical knowledge was communicated pre-discursively through spoken words and body language. Technical knowledge was physically and mentally embodied within each worker. In the earliest years, when Rebecca Lukens operated the business, she kept no copies of her outgoing business correspondence. Incoming correspondence was sorted into pigeonholes and then bundled up and put away. The subject of most of these letters was not technical communication, but the price of blooms, wrought iron bars. She negotiated the price, and when times were hard, she slowed production. If there was any technical communication in the correspondence, it was specifications from customers and agents. This letter requests 110 plates of four different sizes and two different thicknesses for the boiler itself, and eight circular plates to make the riveted boiler heads. They did use technical communication, however, for knowledge collection. Beginning in 1835, they collected patents about making iron direct from the ore. They wanted to be able to make their own blooms in order to have more control over the process and the price. Patents were one of the earliest official forms of knowledge exchange. The single most common type of business writing throughout this period was account books. Account books were used for many things, keeping records of workers' time, coal and material deliveries, household expenses, and even daily events in an industrial town. At Luke and Steel, they used account books in a traditional way. The day book recorded transactions as they occurred, the journal summarized the transactions under the name of the buyer or seller, and was updated once a month, and the ledger summarized the credits and debits from the journal once a year. At Luke and Steel, the accounts were not settled or closed until December of 1871, when they made a lot of money. They actually continued them until 1917. A great deal of information can be extracted from these day books and journals. The historian Charles Dew reconstructed the life of an iron-making town in Bond of Iron, Master and Slave at Buffalo Forge. Julian Skaggs wrote his dissertation, Lucan's 1850 to 1870, from the account books, and he was able to analyze the financial ups and downs of the firm. I took three samples from the year 1820 to see how a single entry moved from volume to volume. I arbitrarily chose John Roberts, and as you can see, his name has a number as well, 176. This transaction was recorded in the day book. Later, the transaction was compiled with others in the journal. At the end of each year, all of his transactions were organized together in the ledger. Rebecca Lukens kept her own journal called the Iron Book for several years. Although there is very little of her own handwriting in her business records, she wrote quite a bit and has many other journals. She also taught her daughter Martha to help with the bookkeeping. Later, Martha's husband, Abraham Gibbons, started the first bank in Coatesville. When Rebecca's sons-in-law took over the business, they brought some modern practices with them. They immediately began keeping copies of outgoing correspondence with the new technology, the letterpress book. This was the Xerox of the 19th century. A special aniline ink was used when writing the letters. Then, while the ink was not fully dry, 
They were placed on a dampened page in the book. If there were multiple letters, blotting paper was placed between them. The resultant image was pressed on the back of the page but viewed through the front. Therefore, the paper was translucent and tissue thin. This is an example of the binding of a letterpress book at the top and the thin pages below. The volumes ranged from 800 to 1,000 pages. Since the pages were repeatedly wet, they easily became difficult to read. Nevertheless, they were often able to capture a reasonable facsimile of the original. Letterpress books came into wide use not only for record keeping, but because the letters were accepted as legal evidence. The overall legibility of the letterpress books increased when Lukens began using a typewriter in 1885. Handwritten text was not immediately replaced by typewritten text. It took them 25 more years before typewriting was widespread throughout the plant. In the letterpress books, you see a mixture of handwriting, typing, and stamps for common tasks, such as standardized orders and receipts. When they first started using letter books in 1849, there were one or two different handwritings discernible. The variety of hands increased as the volume of business increased and the number of people in the office. Sometimes drawings were included as well. Overall, the letterpress books, as difficult as they may be for us to read today, served their purpose. They were able to keep an ongoing record of the paperwork in the mill. Their one disadvantage was that all letters had to come to a central location to be pressed. As the plant grew, the offices were dispersed. In 1903, they discontinued the letterpress books, and each employee kept their own files. When Lukens began using letterpress books in 1849, one book was sufficient for one or two years. By the time they stopped using them in 1903, each year required 10 or more letter books. In some areas, Lukens Steel was an early adopter. They quickly incorporated new and developing technology into their plant. However, in other areas, they were very conservative. As Julian Skaggs noted, they never changed anything until they had to. Therefore, the communication practices described here changed at a snail's pace. From 1810 to 1870, the communication practices, despite the use of the letterpress books and increasing volume, essentially remained the same. However, all that was about to change. This is a picture of their first open hearth furnace that they built in 1890 on the site of the former workers' garden. From this point on, detailed and intensive record keeping became necessary. From that flowed written and visual literacy as more and more workers at the company had to communicate increasingly complex ideas over an increasingly distributed plant. It's interesting to note, however, that they continued the old-fashioned account books until they reincorporated in 1917. In conclusion, I want to reiterate that when I started this research, I didn't know what I was going to find. The period covered in this presentation is 60 years. The period covered in the rest is 55 years. Therefore, in more than half the time covered by my research, very little changed. Sometimes the most interesting results are no results at all. From this contrast, we can get an idea of how fast communication has evolved over the past hundred years.